Once upon a time, before there was time, in the middle of nowhere, for there was nothing, there was a meeting. The Father was there. His beloved Son was there. And the Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit was taking minutes and writing them in a book, and the book is called the volume of the book in the Scriptures. Before there was any creation, the first angel, before time and matter, God had a meeting. And in that meeting, creation was spoken. And in that meeting, you were there, and I were there, and I was there. In that meeting, we were named and chosen. In that meeting, the end was spoken before the beginning. We need to have a major paradigm shift in how we see God's view of us. Before God thought, I must make me a galaxy, or I must make us a universe, it would seem, from what's been revealed from that volume of the book, that you and I were God's ultimate intention in that meeting. And out of that intention for you and I, God spoke an earth, a habitat, for this man, this woman, that was chosen for his own son and for his own purposes. And to support that earth, he spoke into being a galaxy. And to support that galaxy, he spoke into being a universe. And that ultimate intention, that man, that woman that was to be the bride of his son and the tabernacle of his very own being was such in his eyes that when he spoke the universe into being, it has not stopped expanding since. They say it is expanding at the speed of light. I'm suggesting to you that all of this, the earth, the galaxy, the universe, says something of the importance that God sees in this one who was first in the meeting with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were in his heart from before the beginning. It does not end with us at his return at a judgment seat. It begins when he returns with a great wedding feast. And in that feast he will have his first opportunity to see his corporate bride as one. I remember back then, but I've been married 45 years, but the truth is I can, I can come upon my wife unexpected. That is, run into her at the mall not realizing she's there or pass her somewhere. I, it does not happen often, maybe once every couple of years, but we will come upon each other and I will see her unexpectedly and something happens in me still. It still takes place. 
if we were in his heart from before all the rest of it, and we are his ultimate intention, what do you suppose his mind is going to be on when he first sets his eyes on us as the bride at that wedding? Judgment? What could have been? I think not. I think he will be warmed and he will be moved. You know, God is moved. It speaks of his grief and of his pain when we go wayward. He feels and I would think that what we feel and experience is not greater than, surely less than, his capacity for feeling. Our emotions, I cannot imagine them greater than his. The day comes when he, in a way he has never before, except in that meeting, he will set his eyes on us and I believe all that his, was in his heart and was his intention for us will be realized in his feelings as he looks on us. It just begins there. All of the rest of it, all of the rest of it is just preparing, just making ready for the beginning of that which was on his heart back before there was time when there was nowhere. We've got to ask God to move on us by his Holy Spirit so that we can start seeing things as he sees them. He does not see them as we see them. He's not bogged down by our finances, by our relational issues, by all of our distractions. He is singly focused on having his heart satisfied with us. And as I've shared, I believe in our second introductory message, I believe this woman is absolutely on time. I don't believe she is crippled or deformed or lacking in any way. Most of what we see is not her. She is absolutely the pinnacle <coughs> of his creative talents. If he can speak all of this into being with a word, if the, the universe goes forth at a word, if the earth is formed with a word, if life springs forth at, the, at a word, can you imagine what she must look like upon whom he has spent 2,000 years bringing forth. I believe that her beauty will draw from him his response. I believe he will not look across the table or down the aisle or however it takes place and be a bit disappointed. I believe she will exceed, she will exceed what he felt when it was but a dream, when it was but in his mind's eye. And we need to see ourselves in that way. And we need to see ourselves as he sees us. And we need to see our destiny in the light of how he sees our destiny. 
And judgment is not it. It's not what it's about. It has to do with intimacy of relationship. It has to do with the pattern of a bridegroom and a bride, a man and a woman. That's what's on his heart. That's what this is all about. We spent some time last week talking about the difference between an offer and a demand. And we were talking about this gospel of the kingdom. For years I considered this gospel as a demand. And it wasn't until the the series before this one that I felt like the Holy Spirit corrected me on that. It's not a demand, it's an offer. A demand requires performance upon the one who hears the demand. An offer is dependent upon the one who is speaking for it to be carried out. An offer is to be received as a gift. A demand requires, and this particular demand, as seen from the perspective of the law, this demand we cannot fulfill. And God has spent all of the dispensation of the law showing us that. The law was to teach us that it is incapable of transforming us, regenerating us. A demand requires change, an offer is an offer for regeneration on the part of the one who's making the offer. I've spent a little time this week looking, as I've looked at this Christmas season, at how we see the Christ child. And, of course, on this side, having received Christ, we see the Christ child as the king. We see the Christ child as the Son of God. But the truth is, most of us in the West are handling the Christ child like we would handle a child. We're in charge. We really would prefer him to remain helpless. But the truth is, this helpless lamb becomes a servant man. But he's unlike most servants as we've known them, but this is is the pattern of Christ. It's required a paradigm change to see this master, this teacher, You cannot find him demanding anything of his disciples. He doesn't elicit from them commitment. He lives before them his, to them. Unlike, unlike man and the ways of men as we've known it. But this helpless lamb that becomes a servant lamb becomes a king, but he becomes a suffering king. And the truth is, nobody's wanted a a suffering king. We accept the suffering as a substitution for our guilt and our sins. We really rejoice that someone died in our stead. But he's a suffering king. And unlike the kings of the world that come with their knights before them and their armies beside them, he came as a lowly one. His voice was not heard in the street. His message was an offer, not a demand. Who will follow such a king? Instead of raising the bar, he lowered the bar. To serve this king, to worship this king, requires a humility and a bowing that is much lower than we would like. We would prefer standing and shouting our praise. We would prefer a king that uh, his demeanor, his his bronze face, his physique, his, his royal garments, not like the garments of this one, who was raised upon this broken throne, 
whose crown was a means of shedding his own life for the life's in the blood. Who can bow to such a king? But this is how he came. And coming this way, I, I see it in my mind's eye like this. It's, it's like there's this, and this uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, I've seen the first two. I guess we're all waiting for the third one, aren't we? <clears throat> and I remember in the last one, I cannot remember the names of the places, but when we see the, the hordes of the evil army gathering, I mean, it's just beyond imagination, its size and its, its ugliness and its power and its frightfulness. And there are these principalities and powers, a third of all of the angels, and most of mankind are arrayed against this seemingly weak and powerless king who've come to make an offer. I see it like this. Here's this, here's this huge horde of the enemy, and they are standing. The issue, there are not three or four or five issues in the world. There isn't what's going on in Israel with, between the Palestinians and the Jews, and there's something else going on in the Sudan between the Muslims and those other people who, by the way, on, on the whole are Christians. There's only one issue. There's only one war, several fronts, but there's only one battle in all of this creation. And it's all over hindering the coming forth. At first it was all over hindering the male child coming forth. And in a way, it is also about hindering the male child. There's a third male child. You know that, don't you? Why do you think abortion is such a significant issue in our age? Never been a time in history when so many innocents have been slaughtered. The evil one's after the same thing. It's the male child mentioned in Romans chapter 12. That male child is not Jesus. That is the Jesus who came 2,000 years ago. We don't have time for that. But the point is, the patterns have been given to us. But I see, this, I see this great horde of army, and I see this not in armament, uh, not with a helmet, not with the, a great flashing sword, not on a great royal steed, but I see this... He was not too comely to look upon, the word says. He was not known for being handsome. That's the in indication of the word. I see this one walking out onto this battlefield, walking out on this battlefield, and approaching the generals. He's not carrying a white flag, he's just walking out to them, and he's alone. Now, there are those who are behind him, but they're sort of hiding and nervous and uh, not at all imposing from the enemy's point of view. And I see this lowly king, this suffering king, I see him walking out to face the captains of the hordes. And when he gets out to them and uh, they... Uh, in all of their uh, might, uh, looking down upon him. Uh, what do you have to say? Where's your white flag? And he says, I've come to ask your surrender. And I offer you life. And loud enough for all the armies to hear, and I will forgive your deeds. And I will set you free from the oppressors. They all had oppressors. The evil one is not kind to his hordes. There's a reason they are depicted in literature so ugly. And he says, I've come for your surrender. What do you suppose their response is? Well, his response the first time in history was when they sought to take him and kill him, he just simply passed 
through their midst and said, not yet. I'll give you an opportunity to give me the final victory later. But it's not as man was expecting. It's not as we would have liked. This is our king. This is what the one who's preached the gospel of the reign. This is the one who said it's good news. It's an offer. It's an offer. And as you have already guessed and have taken opportunity to express on numerous occasions, we can reject it. We can reject it. And we have on occasion. And when we face the hordes of our enemies on a daily basis, we're forced to consider, are we ashamed of this rain? Is this such a rain that we can bow to? That's the issue. We may be hearing it in the context of a setting where all of us are with friends and allies and those who are with us, but the truth is on a daily basis, we're finding th those decisions not so easy. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. This gospel, this king, has made an offer. To receive that offer, we saw last week, required two things. To receive that offer requires our white flag of surrender. It's called repentance. And what did we say last week was first and foremost of that which we needed to repent of? Self-rule, our own way. And that's the bottom line. The bottom line is not all of these sins we've committed. He's already borne all of those. What he's yet to receive from us is our white flag, our turning our back on, our self-rule, our own way. An about face, a turning to him and his reign. The second thing that is required, and that, that deals with our reign, and there are two issues here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May thy reign come and thy will be done. It's one thing to raise the white flag of reign. And what do you suppose... Well, we looked at it from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The reign is at hand. Repent and believe. Have faith. You know, faith's a gift. Have you figured out yet that you cannot conjure you cannot work up. You cannot make yourself believe. Has anybody realized that yet? To each has been given a measure of faith, but to each has not been given all faith. Faith comes by hearing. And the hearing comes when theos rhema, when God speaks a particular spoken word. When you get this in your heart, it'll correct a lot of the teaching that abuses spiritual faith. Faith's a gift. Faith comes by hearing. It says that he is both the author, the one who first speaks faith into existence. He is the author and the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. You did not first speak faith to yourself. It wasn't first your idea. He authored it. When the time was right, he spoke for you faith. When you understand this, you'll know where to turn when you're needing faith for something. And where is that, by the way? Where do you turn when you're needing faith for something? 
We turn to God. He's the one that speaks it. So if repentance is this first white flag, what is faith? It comes from God. It is the banner that we raise that deals with our will. Faith deals with Adam's old will. Faith comes by hearing when God brings us to faith. So how do we accept the offer? We repent. We turn our back on our self-rule. We turn to him who's speaking to us. Faith. And we, as we've turned our back on our own reign, we turn our back also on our own will, and we raise both the banner of our surrender and of that which he has spoken concerning us. And we find that the offer then becomes ours. But who's going to perform it? If you're still trying to perform, now listen, I know very few Christians who are not. Most of my Christian life has been trying to perform for God. Believing in grace, but still seeing it as a demand. That is the performance that comes once faith has come. But if performance is in there, it's because you've received a demand. When it's an offer, then when faith comes, just as the faith came from him, the performance comes also. Now do it, Lord. Clear evidence of that would be Mary. Be it unto me, Lord, as you have spoken. You can no more produce his life in you than Mary could. Our response is as simple as hers. As you have spoken, do it. It is no harder than that. It is no more difficult than that. It is no more complex than that. Surrender of our reign, raising the banner, raising the banner of faith that he offers with his reign, and then looking to him to finish it. He's both the author and the finisher of our faith. It begins with this offer. This evening we're going to begin in Luke chapter 4. And we're going to look at the nature of this government, this government of God. And we're going to try and get a picture of this lowly one and his ways. He came bringing the gospel of the kingdom. It wasn't of a future-only kingdom, although there is a dispensation coming that is uh, greater than what is being manifested in this time. Uh, We ourselves will be set free from our bodies. We ourselves will receive uh, new bodies uh, like his. Have I missed something? Okay. Okay. Luke chapter 4. Beginning in verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. I've I've started too far down. Let's go back up to verse 14. Chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. Where did he return from, by the way? Wilderness. This is at the beginning of his ministry. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Isn't that interesting? He was praised by all. And news about him, verse 14, spread throughout all the surrounding district. What was the means, by the way, of carrying news in those days? Was there a tabloid that you could pick up at the corner drugstore? You turn on your TV, listen to the radio. I'm telling you it was as effective 
It was their way of, of, of carrying the story, carrying the news. It says the news spread throughout all the region of Galilee, all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I want you to notice verses 20 through 22, their response. That is their initial response. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. How were they fixed on him? With joy or with uh, anger? Well, I don't want you to answer that because for a long time, having heard that story many times, I assumed that right from the beginning they were very displeased with him. Having claimed this text for himself, because that's exactly what he was doing. But notice in verse uh, uh, 21, and he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now notice verse 22, and all and all were speaking well of him. After he quoted Isaiah 61, a text which they knew had to do with the Messiah, He had already been introduced by the news. You see, they were in that district around Galilee. And all were speaking well of him, and, he, and they no doubt knew every time they heard the news, he's one of our own. That's Joseph's boy. He's making a name for himself. He's doing some marvelous things. And then when he comes, he takes, he stands, which is a sign that he wants to read from the Word. When he stood, he had the platform. There's a rabbit trail here. Probably oughtn't to take it. But he stood, and the Pharisees and the scribes or the teacher of that particular synagogue, the rabbi nodded his head the scrolls were taken to him it was isaiah it was a month for isaiah's reading and he however he picked his own text out of isaiah he opens isaiah and he reads isaiah 61 which announces the purpose of the coming of the messiah and then he said this day these words are fulfilled in your midst and they've all heard the news of what's going on with this son of one they know. And how did they respond? I, I'm, it's incredible, the response in verse 22, and then the response in verse 28. In verse 22, And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? They were not saying it un in unbelief. I've read that many times and have pictured all of this as if from the very beginning when he announces that he's the Messiah, and that's what he's doing, that from that moment on, anger was triggered and they were displeased with him and blasphemy was going to be responded to with a, with a, a stoning, throwing him from a precipice. But it wasn't that way at all. He was being well spoken of. There were no critics at this point. He, he reads Isaiah 61, and they receive him well. And they are wondered by the gracious words that fall from his lips. Isn't it interesting how quickly, how quickly gracious words can become something else? What did it? 
What did it? Before I start reading in verses, verse 23, 24, and 25, because when you read, well, we'll read 23, 24, 25, and 26, and 27, and you cannot find in that of itself that which would cause them to turn from this one who was spoken well of, whom they enjoyed his gracious words, and considered the reports of such merit that he might really be this Messiah. Because he was healing blind eyes. He was setting the oppressed free. And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Well, see, they'd heard the stories. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Well, we welcome you. We're speaking well of you. We've received you. We've let you preach. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. But when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow who was not a Jew. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. What's he saying? Is he not ministering in Israel? Is he going over to those Gentiles in his ministry? No, he's ministering only to Jews, except for a few isolated incidences like the Syrophoenician woman or the, or the uh, centurion servant. Otherwise, he said, I, I've been sent to the house of Israel. Is this not the house of Israel? What's going on? Well, you see, when Jesus read Isaiah 61, he left out the last line of the quote. So go with me back to Isaiah 61, and as soon as he tells this story, they remember the rest of Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Oh, that's where it ends. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and... and and the vengeance of our God. Whoops! And then when he talks about Elijah in this context, they remember that Elijah was coming too. Jesus said, if you can hear it, he has, and he will again. What's Jesus saying? What are they saying? Well, you need to see the history. You need to see the context. These were a people who saw themselves captives of Rome. They saw themselves as an oppressed people. They read the prophecies of the Messiah as coming and erecting a throne and bringing under his iron rod all of the heathen nations. Go with me. And we'll go to Revelation 19 because I'm going after the fact. This is spoken of after the days of Christ. But in Revelation 19, we see something here. Verse 11. This is the king we want. Or do we? Well, I spoke to you earlier of a wedding feast. This is the chapter of the wedding. For the bride has made herself ready. All God is waiting on. The beginning of the last minute of time in this dispensation, if we can use that phrase, before the second coming of Christ,
Let me back up here. I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I said, we all would like to receive this king when he comes. We would have preferred this kind of king, or, or would we? This invitation, by the way, to this feast comes by way of an offer. But there comes a time when there is a supper that it's not an offer. If you were to follow this text on down to the end, uh, verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun at and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God. You can go to the wedding feast of the Lamb, or you can be a guest of honor at the supper of God. That's what's being offered. The second is a demand. There's no choice in that one. The first is an offer. Between the two we see, and I saw, verse 11, heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. By the way, it's prophesied that his robe is red. Do you know why it's red? <laughs> it's in the uh, psalm, it's from the splattering of the blood of his enemies. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And then from his mouth comes... When he comes again, if I can say it this way, I would suggest that we find ourselves behind the horse and not in front of it. We will be either with him or against him. The difference is the difference between an offer and a demand. You daily, hourly have a choice to receive by surrender and faith, repentance and faith, you have a choice to receive him as your king, as the Lord in your life, or not. It's not a demand. Sometimes we think it would be easier if it were a demand, don't we? No, it wouldn't. Because he's after something more than performance. We've got to see that. You know, you can perform some things. If it's a demand, probably said this last week, if it's a demand, and our service is out of performance, we might be washing feet, but we'll hate the smell. When it's by having received an offer and the regeneration that comes with it. And if you read St. Francis of Assisi, biography on him, the, change, the major change in his life, the big change came. God was dealing with him, dealing with his reign in his own life. God was dealing with him about the lepers. And God was taking him to the lepers. He was on his horse. He was going to do some, something gracious, something 
benevolent for them. And God wasn't going to stand for that. God wanted him off of his horse and wanted him to embrace this leper. And he could hardly handle the stench until, in obedience, he embraced him. And the instant that he embraced him, now listen, if it's performance, the stench never leaves. That's what set Mother Teresa apart. It was never performance. There's no value in performance. You're not earning little credits. He's offering you himself. What he's offering is his life. Is he one that we can trust with taking over. The truth is, sometimes I want apples. And I don't like the idea of somebody telling me, I don't want you eating that kind of apple. I mean, you think about it in the garden, how ridiculous. I wish it had been over something significant. What was its significance? Do I have the right to tell you what's good for you and what's not? Oh, it's hard, isn't it? It will be uncomfortable. It will be a sacrifice. It will be often too much if it's performance. Receive the offer. Receive the offer. In the offer comes transformation, regeneration. I will not only give you a new spirit, but I will put my spirit in you, and my spirit will cause you to walk in my ways. Is that not a better way? Trade in your old demand. Trade it in. He's got something better. He didn't give you the demand to begin with. There's another who would let you believe that. Do you know what the root of the demand is? What do you suppose the root of the demand is? Our pride. It's our pride. We'd like to believe we could. We'd like to believe there is something good enough in us that could perform if we really wanted to. I'm older than all of you, or at least most of you. I can't. I used to think I could do anything. There's not a single thing that I can do without His grace. Not a single thing. I can't even remember what I'm teaching. You might say it's age. I don't think it's age. I think the Lord's just keeping me humble. That's what I think it is. I mean, I'm standing up preaching Sunday. Right in the middle of my sermon, I've got this illustration. and Get on my illustration, get off on this little rabbit trail, and that's when I get in trouble. (laughs) And my mind went blank. I mean... It was like the day that I was asked to announce uh, the introduce at a mother-daughter's banquet, the mothers and daughters, and I was chosen to introduce them. It was a crystal and candlelight and uh, silver affair, and I'm standing at the door, and Mr., uh, uh, mother and daughter, mother and daughter by name, and who's the only name I could not remember? I mean, I went blank. So it's not age. My wife's mother, which is ten times worse. (laughs) Ten times worse. And she never forgave me for that for the longest time. I don't mean weeks or months or a few years. (laughs) So I'm in front of, I've been asked to speak at this church for the next three Sundays, and, and I'm in the middle, and 
I just have to, what, do, what, what, can, I, what can you do? <laughs> Somebody tell me where I was. Where was I? <laughs> now listen, listen. There was a day when I couldn't suffer that. I couldn't. I couldn't handle it. I chose to come to you with not wise and persuasive words. If when the speaking is done, you've only heard John or whoever, you've lost. If when I've got done, all I've done is convince you that I know, we've lost. It's important that you see the cross in John Brown's life. It's important that you see that without his grace, I'm like you without his grace. Is this coming through? Several of you know me long, have known me long enough. It's been the story of my life, hasn't it, Teresa? More or less, yes. All of our lives. All of our lives. I suggest to you that you turn in the demand. It doesn't mean that we will not be bearing fruit or producing good works, which from before the foundation of the earth were ordained. But we'll be doing it out of his life and he'll get all the credit and the glory. Because he will have performed it. He will have done it. I guess I don't need to say it again and turn in the demand. This is his way. But well, what's going on here in uh, Isaiah 61? What's going on between them? They were expecting a king, king that would release them from the oppression that was from outside. They weren't expecting a king that was going to begin first with dealing with the oppression that was from within. They did not see that they had a need to be delivered from within, these scribes and these Pharisees. Have you ever tried to give anybody something whose hands are full? Have you gone to share something that you believe the Lord called you to go and share and there's no ears to hear because they've got so much to tell you? They could not hear. They, from the very beginning, were sitting in judgment upon him and the judgment was good as long as it appeared to be Rome that was at issue, sickness and lameness, blindness, etc. But as soon as the sore, the cancer was them, as soon as they heard the words, vengeance, the day of the vengeance of our God, and they remembered the rest of Isaiah 61, they knew they knew how he was applying it. Who can receive such a king? Who can receive such a king? He's come to touch your full hands. He's come to bring you to an end of yourself that he might be able... And the truth is, everything that was prophesied about him, all of this prophecy, to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. He came to do all of that. And he did. 
Let's go to Isaiah chapter 42. Reading from verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. I want you to see this phrase. Who's the only one that can bring forth justice to the nations? What is it that brings justice to a nation? To a nation? It's a government. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Jesus came to do that. Is that going to be a work that has been reserved for the second coming? No. He will not cry out or raise his voice. I'm telling you, when he comes out, this, when he comes this next time, this sword that goes out is out of his mouth. They will be slain by what proceeds from his mouth. If he can speak into existence all that is if, that is just with a word, do you think he's quite able to slay those with the word of his mouth? I, I suggest to you it's no no big issue, no, no real problem, no big deal. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. This is our king. This is the nature of, of our king. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. He's come to reign. Not in his second coming, in his first coming. Isaiah chapter 9. Again, a prophecy of this, of this king. Reading from verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of the harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Is that the second coming? Is the gladness over his reign at the second coming? Yes, there will be gladness by the citizens of the kingdom when he comes again. But this is not the second coming. When we grow up a little bit, we'll start dancing. When we're in the freedom of the offer and have moved beyond the demand, we will not be able to keep our feet from dancing. We will be so overwhelmed with joy because of his reign, because of his reign, that we will be a nation of people filled with gladness. I could use a little gladness. Can you? Lay down the demand and its performance. Get to know this king. Understand the offer. Recognize he is in us establishing justice. He is setting free. He's dealing with the oppression. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff of their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Second coming... Thank you, Lord. And the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. I'm out of time on this section. Two marks of the uniqueness of this government, justice and peace. Things set right and peace. Most of my Christian life, I've not been at peace. I know very few Christians who are at peace. Why? 
What is the cause that has robbed us of peace? Anyone? Beg pardon? Self reign and the accompanying demand and performance. Demand and performance as opposed to offer and reception, surrender, raising the banner of faith. Praise his holy name. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we're asking that, that you sow in us that which we're able to bear. Father, we're looking for fruitfulness. Plant it deep. Deal with the tares, the concerns, the issues of this life. Bring forth fruit, Lord, from your word. We ask in Christ. Amen. We're going to break here for just seven minutes. We will begin at 8.30. 8.30.